It's my nerd world, and welcome to it, a Star Wars show. This week, the Mando brings the magic, and Bad Batch brings the sadness. Thank you so much for taking time out and checking out this week's episode. Remember, you can head on over to mynerdworld.net. There you can get information about all the podcasts with my nerd world, and of course, my science fiction space opera series, Embark, where you can follow a ragtag squadron of pilots and one reluctant hero on a journey of survival from Earth to the far reaches of space as they fight for humanity's future among the stars. Nothing will stand in our way. I find your lack of faith disturbing. I will finish what you started. Who are you? I'm no one. There are stories about what happened. It's true. All of it. The Force. It's calling to you. My nerd road. Just let it in. It is my nerd world, and I'm your host... John Justice, a Star Wars show, here to talk about all things Star Wars. And in a time when, I don't know, the past couple of episodes, um, or in recent episodes, I've been a little bit down on the franchise of Star Wars, i am got to admit, I've really been enjoying uh, the content that they have been providing as of late between The Mandalorian and The Bad Batch. Of course, we had... The two-part season finale of The Bad Batch, I'll talk about that in the latter part of the episode. Got a little bit of uh, listener feedback this week. Going to spend a majority of time talking um, about The Mandalorian. There are some news items that are floating around, some rumors that are floating around. Star Wars Celebration takes place in Europe next week. And the expectation is we're going to have a lot of news Next week, coming out of Celebration. Uh, More about the TV shows. Certainly, I'm hoping for more about the potential theatrical releases, which, according to the reports and the rumors that we've seen, it all remains in flux. So I really don't know what to believe anymore. So for this week, I just want to spend a few minutes talking about these three episodes of uh, The Mandalorian and the two-part season finale for uh, The Bad Batch. So let's go ahead and get to it. As a as an overview, uh, before I get into the details of the pirate, uh, this week's uh, Mandalorian episode in season three, I'm really enjoying this season, and i i wasn't I wasn't sure when the season started, and really, when I go and judge these shows and most content. It comes down to a rewatchability factor for me. If I enjoy it, I'm going to go and rewatch it. I treat my uh, television for the most part, okay? Um, especially with the the franchises that I in, uh, that I enjoy. I treat my television a lot like I do my music. I'm going to go back and listen to music over and over again. I'm not kind of a one and done person if you haven't figured this hadn't figured this out yet. So, especially with Star Wars, I typically treat Star Wars from an aspect of how rewatchable is it. And The Mandalorian, of all the live-action shows, uh, as I've said, is the most rewatchable. I've I've rewatched both the first and second seasons multiple times, and each episode uh, multiple times. And heading into this season, because I was a little jaded with Star Wars as of late, as I've talked about, I enjoyed... Um, Andor, I've been watching a bit of Andor, but more having it on in the background. Um, I've tried to go back and watch Obi-Wan Kenobi and just haven't really enjoyed it. And Book of Boba Fett, I've done a rewatch on and watched those episodes multiple times. Um, But it's not one that I really go, I want to go watch this. The Mandalorian is one where I go, I want to go watch this. And this season is turning into that. Apart from the episode, uh, two episodes ago, where we had the middle portion of on Coruscant, and I need to go back and watch that episode again in in its entirety. I've watched the beginning of it again, of that episode again, just because of the, um, 
the ship battle element of it, uh, which we certainly got a lot in this episode as well. Uh, I'm loving the fact that we're getting a lot more vehicles and a lot more vehicle action in these episodes, but the storyline that they are building up to is really compelling. And it's making me want to go back uh, to go back. <laughs> I say I fast for I I I flashed forward to batch for crying out loud. I can't talk. <clears throat> it's been a long morning. It's making me want to go back and restart the episode, uh, the seasons one and two again. That's how much that I've been enjoying these episodes. And I'm finding them to be rewatchable, whether it was last week's and certainly this week's as well. So all of that is to say that for as down as I may have been on Star Wars recently, I really do feel like they've been on the top of their game with these with these episodes. It has some of its cheesier moments, but I've been enjoying that. So let's get into this to this episode. We have uh, the pirates that were introduced earlier in the season, who it was rumored would end up being the villains in the Skeleton Crew series. And clearly, spoiler alert moving forward, based on the fact that the... Um, and I can't remember the head pirate's name, so I'm just going to call him Salad Head because he looks like a salad. Um, I can't take credit for that. I heard I heard that on another show, but he does. He looks like a salad. The fact that all of his pirates, except for one, ended up getting killed, including his his ship, kind of takes away the potential that these individuals are going to be the villain in the skeleton crew. Although, I'm hearing word that th- this pirate element is a larger faction. It's a larger group of pirates, and so we will see more of these in the future. And we first saw these types of villains in the resistance cartoon now that was aimed at a younger audience still i I enjoyed that 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 animated series but we did see some pirates in that series that are very familiar in terms of the styling of these particular pirates and it's a little over the top at how much they're dressed like pirates in the show but it's star wars and there's a level of cheesiness to star wars and so we have at the beginning of the episode the establishment of the the pirates coming to Navarro to go and enact their revenge for what had taken place in the uh, in the opening episode uh, in the opening episode of of season three. We uh, cut to you know Grief Carga sending off a hologram to uh, Carson uh, and, and on this new Republic establishment, which felt an awful lot like the Scarif level on the battlefront game that I played but I really liked the fact that we've we got to see what echoed the rebellion strongholds the rebellion hideouts that we saw whether in the force awakens um in the rise of skywalker or you know say yavin 4 in the original trilogy it really reminded me of, of that this new republic establishment and it was a bit of a um a glimpse into what I think we were supposed to get with this Rangers of the New Republic series. If you remember, several well, a few years ago, when they announced the slate of upcoming live-action shows, Kathleen Kennedy had announced this Rangers of the New Republic. It's all been canceled as of right now, but I think we've gotten a glimpse now of what that would have been. It would have potentially been this New Republic outpost, outside of Coruscant and outside of the Hosnian system. And there's a reason for that. I'll, I'll, I'll kind of jump ahead. There's a lot of speculation that Coruscant is going to come into play, whether in this season of The Mandalorian or Ahsoka. This is potentially all leading to, and this isn't really spoilers for anything. This is just what's being extrapolated. Um, there's some rumors out there, but this is the extrapolation. And we were told this much in... The Mandalorian last season when we met Ahsoka, she's searching for Thrawn and she's searching for Thrawn and she will be with Sabine to find Ezra. We also now have this change up with Bo-Katan at the urging of the armorer to go and bring the clans back together because Bo-Katan has admitted to the armorer that she saw the mythosaur, which is supposed to be, as legend goes, a precursor to the revival of the uh, of the man uh, of the Mandalorians. And so we are culminating potentially down the line in the Mandalorian, maybe the Book of Boba Fett, perhaps the skeleton crew, but definitely Ahsoka all coming together in this larger event 
that Kathleen Kennedy had teased so long ago that will more than likely entail the return of Thrawn, perhaps a portion of his fleet from when they disappeared at the end of the Rebels series. And if you didn't watch Rebels, you're going to be a little bit lost. But at the end of Rebels, Thrawn via the Purgol, who can fly through hyperspace, and his fleet took off as Ezra saved his group, and they flew to some unknown region. And so the Ahsoka show is going to be the search for Ezra and more than likely the return of Thrawn as this threat. Now we have Bo-Katan going out to go and reunite the clans together, which may cause some issues because as you jump to the end of this episode, there may be a tie-in to Moff Gideon that may cause some problems for Bo for Bo-Katan. Okay, so all of this to get back to the beginning of the show is that Rangers of the New Republic was probably going to be this group that we saw in this New Republic establishment going out and helping the different planets on, you know, on a weekly basis on different adventures, perhaps leading to a to a larger to a larger story. We certainly saw a bit of that with the meeting of of uh, Zeb as well from Rebels, and I'll talk about that here in the moment. So the pirates may be playing into a part of this. Carson alludes to as much in the episode. The pilot who goes and finds the covert on their hidden planet after R5-D4 kind of gives up the location of uh, of where they are. But this is all building towards something. And he even says as much at the end of the episode. Carson thinks all of this is related, including potentially the the pirates. All right, so let's get back to the episode, and I'll kind of go back in uh, in, in a bit more of the, uh, of the order of the episode itself. And so Grief Karga sends out this message to this new Republic establishment. We're introduced back to the villain that we saw that ended up taking Dr. Pershing and torturing him. It's pretty clear in my book now that she's working both sides, and there's a part of what she's doing with the new Republic that is to get Moff Gideon back. She's always been the villain, but she's playing both sides in in this. Uh, don't know whether or not she has anything to do with the um, busting out, if you will, from the Lambda shuttle of Moff Gideon at the end of the episode, but clearly she's working on the inside in order to benefit him, and the tense conversation between her and uh, Carson was certainly alluding to that, especially with her sort of playing a bit of an homage in the writing to uh, Anakin Skywalker and Attack of the Clones in the um, the meadow scene among the waterfalls where he's talking about, you know, sort of, well, if it works, you know, that sounds an awful lot like a dictatorship. She's talking about how perhaps those individuals on Navarro need to be shown that they need our help because they're not a part of what we're doing. You know, he mentions... The and alludes to that's empire kind of thinking, and she says, "Well, maybe that needs to happen." That all seemed like a bit of a a callback to that exchange between Anakin and Padme in uh, in Attack of the Clones. But of course, Carson ends up going and finding the covert uh, anyways. Why they called him Blue when he arrived at the covert? I'm not sure. I don't know if it's the blue because of the um the logo uh, for the Republic. Uh, don't know exactly why. I would have liked a little bit of uh, clarification or at least maybe pointing to why they called him Blue when he arrived needing needing hope. And this puts, of course, um, the Covert and uh, the Mandalorians in a bit of a pickle because they now have their location exposed. But this, of course, plays into the motivation for the Mandalorians to go and help Grief Karga on Navarro. Uh, given the fact that there's land available that they can go and live on, although I don't think they're going to be staying on Navarro for uh, for very long. All of the moments leading up to this part of the show, I just really, really enjoyed. I love, I just, I love, I love my spaceships, and I love seeing the ships travel from location to location. And it's just to me, as I sort of tap into that, you know, inner twelve to sixteen year old that you know, is still wowed and amazed at ships flying around. To see them arrive at a location, seek it out, land, and get out, I kind of jokingly said in the middle of the episode, I could watch, you know, 40 minutes of just ships traveling around landing and pilots getting out, and that would actually go and and uh, and make me happy. Similar thing in the Bad Batch episode when they um, took off in the V-Wings and we got to see uh, the troopers, the stormtroopers, go and get into the ships. I just love, I, I absolutely love seeing that. We end up getting the scene inside the cave where the covert has to make a choice. 
Apparently, the holding of the armorer's, um, I don't know, hammer, mallet, whatever you want, hammer, is representative of something. If you're holding the, if you're holding the best car mallet, then or hammer, then you know you have the you have the floor. Uh, we get the uh, Mandalorian speech, and then we get the pa- the Paz Vizsla speech, which was a bait and switch. Where at first you think he's not going to go along with this, and then he agrees because. The Mandalorian hasn't steered them wrong. He helped save his son, and they make the choice to go help grief, Car- uh, 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 grief Karga. When we arrive back to Navarro, I really enjoyed this scene from the standpoint of it reminded me of Pirates of the Caribbean at Disneyland. As a matter of fact, I was thinking, oh my gosh, they could do an overlay of the Mandalorian on the Pirates of the Caribbean which a bun- with a bunch of these drunk Mandalorian pirates trashing the place, stumbling around in the streets. I just immediately was like, oh my gosh, this is Pirates of the Caribbean. And whether or not that was completely intentional or not, I I have to believe there was a bit of a nod to that because there's an interesting reference to a James Cameron movie that was pretty direct in my opinion. I don't know if anybody else picked up on it, but I certainly did when it happened. And I'll say what that is in just a moment. Um, We get the Mandalorians laying out their game plan prior to the arrival on Navarro, which was so quintessential Star Wars. I mean, how many times have we seen that? And that is just a Star Wars tradition. We get the hologram. We get one person saying, this is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to lay it out. And I love those moments. I mean, again, that is just, that is Star Wars tradition through and through. And uh, those never disappoint in um, in my opinion. Um, and then we have the arrival of the man of, of the Mandalorians and the action sequence that breaks open um, on the planet as they go up against the uh, the pirates. And it was all great. I had no issue with it. I loved every moment of it. This was one of those scenes where I'm watching and going, "Oh my gosh, I'm going to watch this episode over and over again." And then thinking back to all of the other space and in atmosphere battles that we've received so far this season and. Um, it may end up being one of my favorites just from that standpoint of, you know, I love my um, I love my spaceships uh, battling. Uh, the scene on the ground was great, too. Uh, the mentioning when when Mando arrived, when he first talks with Grief Karga about how, you know, hey, we're here to get the land sort of reestablishing the motivation here, apart from the Mandalorian helping his friend out, obviously. Right. The pirates themselves are cheesy. There's a lot of individuals, especially during the pirates are drunk walking through the town scene that um, looks like dudes in a mask, but it's also Star Wars and the original Star Wars was dudes in a mask. So, you know, and ladies. Uh, So I can totally forgive all of that. I mean, it's not even a matter of forgiving. I just that's Star Wars. Uh, I will say that as I go back to the cameo just briefly, uh, the cameo of Zeb from Rebels was just fantastic. Um, clearly the face was CGI'd and this was a bit of a preview of him being, in my opinion, Ahsoka. And this was kind of a, Hey, here's your cameo of the week, but don't worry, Zeb will be back. So that was, that was really cool. And it has me even more excited for Ahsoka than I was before. Uh, that was a character that I absolutely loved on rebels. But as I watched it, you kind of go, well, how are they going to pull off Zeb in live action? And they did a, an absolute, um, uh, an absolutely a, uh, a fantastic job. At the end of the battle on Navarro, where the Mandalorians finally win, I did think it was a little, for lack of a better way to describe it, a little Boba Fett-ish that we had sort of such a small group of people living in the city, which seems such, you know, much larger. Um, I know it's the nature of being a television show, and you can easily go and sort of head canon extrapolate that perhaps a vast majority of people had already vacated the city when the pirates arrived in the first place, but it just seemed a little thin there at the end. Um... But again, it's Star Wars, and you can get away with it. We had the sort of wrap-up scene of the Mandalorians there with Grief Karga and the people of Navarro and the establishing that the Mandalorians are now allowed here on, you know, Navarro. So they'll go ahead and find their home. My expectation is eventually they're all going to leave and end up back on Mandalore. I'll get to more of that in just uh, in just a moment. And then we get this unexpected scene of the armorer bringing Bo-Katan back down underground where the covert used to reside, her telling the story of uh, the uh, the oven, I can't remember what it was called, um, the forge, 
That's right, it was the Forge. And she goes into detail of the larger Forge on Mandalore. And then this moment where the armorer tells Bo-Katan to take her helmet off. And I don't know about you, but I'm watching this going, what is going on? I thought it was a test for a moment. Like, oh, you failed the test. You're out of, you're, you're an apostate now. You took your helmet off. Ha ha. Um, but it wasn't. Uh, the armorer has other intentions. And whether or not they're on the up and up remains to be seen. I thought for a moment the armorer was going to take her helmet off. Uh, I thought I really was expecting that to happen, but of course it, it didn't. And then when they go back to the surface and all the Mandalorians, including Din Djarin, the Mandalorian, are all very confused on why Bo-Katan and her red bobbed haircut is now exposed for all to see. And we find out that um, she is now tasked with going and finding the clans. So again, sort of laying out where the story is going and uh, has my curiosity uh, peaked. You know, you have Carson from the New Republic saying everything is is related with what's going on. He was mentioning this when he was trying to get permission to bring out some forces to Navarro, and that was shot down by the guy in charge, played by Tim Meadows, which I thought he did a great job. At the end of the episode, though, on his way back, we get Carson and his... Um, X-Wing um, coming across the downed Lambda shuttle in the middle of space. I thought it was cool that they the little R2 eye out the top of the dome popped out and was used as a probe, and he goes into the shuttle. This is where the tribute to James Cameron, uh, James Cameron's Aliens comes into play. Uh, the, the, the screening laser, uh, the blue light with the mist, was straight out of the beginning of Aliens when they first find Ripley floating in that spaceship. So that whole scene was kind of a tribute to aliens in and of itself. And then we get the reveal that there was Beskar that was left behind on there, which would allude to, obviously, a Mandalorian going and breaking him out. Initially, I was thinking that, well, is this Boba Fett that did it? But the more that I thought about it and heard on the MakingStarWars.net podcast, they didn't have any inside information but when you consider that bo katan is going out to find more clans perhaps bo katan is going to end up finding a clan that actually is working with moff gideon now and perhaps moff gideon himself was a mandalorian considering the fact that he had the dark saber in the first place when you go back to um wow season two right yeah season two so um, oh, no, season one. Excuse me. I'm sorry. Season one. He has the Darksaber. So we're going to find out that Gideon has some connection to Mandalorians and that this is probably going to end up impacting Bo-Katan um, when she goes out to tr- sort of reunite the clans. And again, uh, this is all leading and culminating, you know, leading towards Thrawn returning, Ezra returning. We're seeing the building of a quasi-empire that, as I mentioned before, may involve these pirates, but more than likely, most likely, will involve the return of Thrawn. This is going to ultimately fail, leading to the First Order. That's where all of this is is heading. Probably because it's too segmented. Probably because it's not, um, it's not fully fleshed out, and it's kind of cobbled together. You're going to see a reunited Mandalore and Mandalorians who will be able to push back on this and more than likely defeat Thrawn when all is said and done, um, along with Ahsoka and the group from Rebels and probably a part of this new Republic, all of which is going to be more than likely damaged in the process and the elimination of Thrawn, which will bring about the First Order. That's where I think all of this is heading. Love the episode. Um, Not ready to sort of place this season alongside of the other seasons, except to say that I'm enjoying it, at least at the moment, as much as I was seasons one and two. And I find these um, wholly uh, rewatchable. But as always, what do you think? Talkshownerd at gmail.com, or if you're watching on YouTube, you can go and check it out there as well. This is not going to go the way you think. All right, let's get into... Um, a bit of the season finale of The Bad Batch. And uh, what a season finale it was. Uh, I'm not going to lie. I was (laughs) was moved to tears at the end of this thing and actually had to pause it at one point going, there's not enough time, there's not enough time. I mean, that's typically the mark of a show or a movie that I'm enjoying when I'm checking the clock because 
I want something to be resolved, and it's not going to be. So um, the first episode of the two-parter was, um, it was good. Uh, certainly, you know, sort of setting up to the bigger finale and played out much in the way the Bad Batch does. It it wasn't, um, uh, how do I want to, how do I, it wasn't steeped in lore. We were doing Bad Batch missions uh, as we typically do. And it had me a little bit curious at the start of whether or not, you know, we were going to culminate in anything or if this was just going to be sort of a mission and it will end. Um I wasn't sure, and I didn't know what the future was for the Bad Batch at this point in time. Like, was there be a season three? And obviously, we're leading towards a season three based off of what happens at the um, at the end of the episode. So, just a few things that uh, that I wanted to mention about it: the arrival of of um, Saw Guerrera. Name escaped me for a moment. That took me by surprise, and I had to laugh a little bit because. The Saw Guerrera that we saw in Clone Wars initially, originally, obviously looked very different from the Saw Guerrera that we ended up seeing in Rogue One. Then we had a version of Saw Guerrera that was closer to the one in Rogue One that we got in Rebels. Now we have Saw Guerrera back with Bad Batch, and he's kind of this combination of the two. He looks more like the Saw Guerrera that we saw in the Clone Wars, but you can tell that they're trying to sort of work him to be the version that we saw later on. The female with him, I fully expected to have them take their helmet off and it to be Jin Erso. If you remember from Rogue One, uh, he ditched Jin when she was a teenager. Looking at the timeline of when Bad Batch is taking place compared to... Um, when we get to Rogue One, there's an argument to be made that potentially that could have been Jyn Erso, so I'll be interested to see if that plays out. I doubt it now just because for that to show itself potentially next season um, may not be a big of a paid off considering how big of a distance we saw that we'll have between the end of season two and the start of season three, you know, meaning... Meaning, if you get the if you get a reveal of Jenner so down the line, maybe you'll go, oh hey, she was in the stormtrooper outfit, but more than likely not. So I was anticipating her to take her helmet off, whoever that um, that other uh, rebel or a part of partisan, I guess if you will, of Saw Gerrera, um was. Uh, we did get a brief cameo of Director Krennic in the scene around the meeting table with Grand Moff Tarkin, even though he only had a few words. Uh, of course, we had the mention of Stardust, which is the Death Star, so no big surprise there. Uh, and, you know, the big thing that ended up happening was the um, the sad fate of Tech. Uh, there's debate in the Justice household over whether or not Tech is dead. I am going with Tech being dead. Um, the uh, youngest member of the household in Kyle does not want Tech to be dead and thinks that, well, we didn't actually see the body. Uh, we just saw the glasses. Maybe Tech can come back. I'm going with Tech is dead, but anything is possible at this point in time. There could be some rational explanation how he survived that fall. He is pretty clever. Um, but at this point, uh, I'm going with Tech is dead, and I was sad and shed a tear at that because I saw kind of kind of saw that being forecasted and uh, didn't want it to happen, but it did. And, you know, it raised the stakes for all of them. There was a moment watching uh, the episode that I really thought that they were all going to go down. So... I was glad glad at the end that they uh, that they didn't. So I want to jump to the end of the episode, though. Um, and um, Omega is taken by Hemlock. Clearly, this is a setup for the Bad Batch season three, which will be um, them going and searching for Omega, Omega, and getting her back. Uh, I thought that this was potentially going to be the end of the Bad Batch series altogether, and that they would all you know, live happily ever after on Padu, the planet that we'd visited in the previous episodes. And maybe that would be an explanation as to where they've been. They've just been on that planet the whole time and it's far away from everything else. So they weren't involved in the larger conflict that, that takes place in the original trilogy. Um, and then who knows about the sequel trilogy, but clearly um, Bad Batch is meant to go on. And now it'll be the search to get o uh, Omega back. 
The question that I have, well, I got a couple of questions here. One, we all picked up on, and if you did too, please let me know, talkshownerd at gmail.com. Uh, Dr. Emery Carr, the imperial female scientist, I said when we first were introduced to her, she sounded like Omega, and she looked like Omega. But I didn't see that happening because it wouldn't make Omega as special as she is, but now I think I understand why. Um, We get Omega back at the Imperial compound. Um, she's introduced to Dr. Emery Carr. Emery says that she's her sister. Okay, so we're assuming that Emery Carr must be either she is also a clone or perhaps she is what they used in the genetic makeup of Omega to make her female, perhaps. So we still need an answer to that. But it seems clear to me that maybe if Emery Carr is a clone as well, that Omega isn't necessarily as special as we thought. And the reason why Hemlock needed to bring Omega back was because he needed Nala Se to continue the cloning work. And that would be the motivation to get Nala Se, the Kaminoan, to get back to doing the work that was needed. It reminds me a little bit of the way that it played out in Rogue One um, with um, Galen or so when Krennic went and got him and brought him and his and Kira back or wanted to bring them back to the Empire to finish work on the Death Star and he needed to find a reason to go and, and motivate him to uh, to do that. So this, of course, raises the question of what is the Emperor doing? And I think this is where the Bad Batch is tying into the Mandalorian, where we have this continued thread that runs over and past the original trilogy of... Palpatine's trying to accomplish something. So, I like to believe, and I hope it's Palpatine cheating death. We know whether or not this is the creation of Snoke, whether or not this is just simply the beginnings and how long it takes Palpatine to cheat death, beyond just having it be a clone. And and I, I really hope this is where they're going for this reason. So, my theory is that the cloning, Nala Se, Omega... Going into the Mandalorian after the original trilogy, Grogu, midi-chlorians, Palpatine is trying to figure out how to cheat death. And it's not just making a clone of himself, it's making a clone that he can get his consciousness into. That's where I think all of this is. Snoke is a byproduct that he ends up using while they continue to do this, and he finally pulls it off, but it still didn't quite work because the clone of him is still messed up we know that ray's father was also a direct clone but clearly one that palpatine couldn't get his consciousness into that ends up being figured out by the time we get to return of the jedi that's how he returns in the rise of skywalker and this is what i'm driving at i think it would be awesome if all of this is pointing to and all of this is telling the story of how Palpatine ended up doing what he was doing and why he came back in The Rise of Skywalker. I think that would be a stroke of brilliance. Because now you have not a glossed over dark side clonings line. Now you have a full slate of stories that explain how that happened. And it's not just from a, I want to stick it to the fandom kind of thing, you know, because I, as a fan, I'm willing to accept that. Star Wars, you have to accept a lot of things and, you know, and don't have a lot of explanation for things. And we certainly didn't when the original trilogy came out. We had no idea what the Clone Wars were for crying out loud and look at what we have now. I think it would be awesome if the, if if this these stories that we're getting right now all this cloning has been Palpatine trying to cheat death. How do I cheat death? How do I keep myself alive? How do I just not create a clone of myself to carry it on? How do me right now in my existence transfer that into somebody else? And that's what we end up seeing in him in The Rise of Skywalker. And if these stories are all building up to that, I just think it would be a brilliant, brilliant storytelling. Talkshownerd at gmail.com. We'll see. I mean, obviously, there has to be something to that because we don't know any other cloning beyond that. Apart from 
the Zillow Beast aspect of it, the return of the Zillow Beast, there could be something on a lesser scale that doesn't involve Palpatine trying to cheat death. He's trying to utilize the power of the Zillow Beast. We know that that's a part of this as well. Um, so that could be the Bad Batch element of it. But And maybe in The Mandalorian, Moff Gideon, Grogu, Dr. Pershing, all of that is the Emperor trying to go and cheat death. And, and again, I... I think that's where we're going. It makes the logical sense that we would go there, and I think that it would be the the, the best way to tell the story and also to enhance the enjoyment of the sequel trilogy in giving us a further explanation of how that all ended up uh, playing out. I need someone to show me my place in all this. All right, just got a couple of uh, listener feedbacks this week. The first comes from uh, Michael Tennant. said, it was really good seeing Ahmed Best last week's episode. The fans did him dirty. Of course, he played Jar Jar Binks. Uh, I'm not too concerned about losing um, writers, as this seems to be the norm lately, referring to Damon uh, Lindelof dropping off of the um, alleged Star Wars movie production. Um, I really think they need to just give Tony Gilroy a trilogy. Of course, he was in charge of Andor, did the uh, the reshoots for Rogue One. Been loving season two of Bad Batch. Thank you, Michael. Always great to hear from you. Uh, Brian Thomas writes, Maybe I'm too much of a normie, but the Mam- Mandalorian is simply boring this season. Andor was the best of Star Wars TV, and it was filmed before the rest of the shows, but not released until after the others. Uh, check out the critical drinker who can explain the problems with Star Wars far better than I can. Uh, no offense, Brian, I will not be checking that out. I, I, I have, I get no enjoyment from people that share all the reasons why they hate Star Wars. Yes, I know, I've been critical on here, but I'll still go back and watch Obi Wan Kenobi, even though I just think that the production was rushed and they didn't utilize the volume the way that they, they, they should have. Um, and as proof that it's all subjective, um. I find it interesting that you think that Andor is the best of Star Wars TV, and yet you're calling The Mandalorian boring, because I would see it as completely opposite. I thought Andor was great, um, but it was certainly slow compared to what we see in The Mandalorian. But again, it's all subjective, and everybody likes what they like. And so that's cool that you like that for what it is, and um, that I like it for what it is uh, as well. All right, that wraps up the episode. Again, talkshownerd at uh, gmail.com is my uh, email address. Leave a comment up on YouTube. Uh, And if it is, as always, one of your first times listening and you're a reader, you clearly like science fiction, I hope you'll take a moment and check out my science fiction uh, space opera series, Embark. Um, Written for adults, but great for ages 11 and uh, older. If you like your science fiction uh, space opera to be epic, with some romance, a lot of action. Um, I really enjoyed creating unique and different um, space battles and in-atmosphere battles uh, as a part of the war that takes place within uh, the seven stories. Uh, That was one of the things that I enjoyed doing along with writing the characters. Uh, I hope that you make an emotional connection to my stories in the middle of the battles that take place. Uh, But I... You know, I ask you to go and check out my uh, my science fiction series. It's available on uh, ebook, paperback, hardcover, and uh, audio book on uh, Amazon.com. Search for John J O N Justice, uh, or go to MyNerdWorld.net. All right, back again uh, next week with the next episode of The Mandalorian and whatever information that we get from Star Wars uh, Celebration Europe. I hope wherever you are, you are happy, you are healthy, and you are safe. And I'll talk to you again next week. Bye. The Force will be with you, always. My Nerd World.